Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, the U.S. Supreme Court clears the way for dreamers to get driver's licenses. We'll hear why the flu season could be especially bad this year, and we'll look back on the life of the late Phoenix Mayor John Driggs. That's next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The U.S. Supreme Court today denied a request by Arizona Governor Jan Brewer to block an appeals court ruling that allows young illegal immigrants with deferred deportation to get driver's licenses. That means dreamers could be getting those licenses within days. Here to tell us more is Dan Picota, senior counsel with the Arizona ACLU, which fought on behalf of the dreamers. Thank you so much for coming in. We Good appreciate it. Good to be here. Uh, what exactly did the Supreme Court do today? Well, the Supreme Court denied the uh, request request from the state, from the defendants, from the governor, uh, to hold off uh, what was a very strong Ninth Circuit opinion uh, that found that the governor's actions were unconstitutional and illegal, uh, discriminatory against uh, the dreamers, that was based on animus towards the dreamers and not any legitimate governmental objective, and said uh, that uh, that cannot stand and ordered that they be given uh, their licenses as, as has occurred throughout this country. Now, but this case still has to go back to the Ninth, correct? Technically? No, it already has. I mean, the Ninth Circuit did not waste any time today. It went back to the Ninth so Circuit today. So it's already been done. It's, it, okay. it, it already set out its mandamus, uh, uh, its mandate rather, I'm sorry, its mandate uh, to the uh, district court, and we expect within a matter of days the district court will enter as required uh, the order uh, that uh, uh, no longer permits uh, the state of Arizona to deny these licenses in this discriminatory manner. So when will ADOT, do you think, start beginning to uh, send out applications or accept applications? Well, uh, hopefully they won't use uh, stalling techniques because the law is clear uh, that they have to follow the federal courts, any state uh, agency. Uh, so I would hope within this calendar year for sure uh, the licenses would begin to flow to folks who have waited much too long uh, for that to occur. And they, those, those kids still would have to pass written and oh, driving sure. tests? Oh, sure. They won't get any special uh, exactly. treatment yeah. by, by um, uh, a, a dot, but uh, they will be treated as any other applicant for a driver's license and not automatically excluded, as has been the case. How many young people affected by this in Arizona? I think it's approximately 25,000 uh, DACA recipients in the state at the moment. And now, in and, and, and the course of this, we had heard that originally uh, the governor's actions had dealt with these, these DACA kids, the, these, these dreamers. But then when the court said that's discriminatory because you weren't uh, impacting other deferred folks, uh, she went ahead and tried to include them as well and did to a certain extent. Are they included in this rule? Well, they're not automatically included. We certainly believe the reasoning uh, would apply to that group and that any uh, reasonable official state executive uh, would understand what the word illegal means, i.e. unconstitutional, and in this case uh, recognize that they, uh, for the same reasons that they were found to illegally have denied drivers licenses to DACA recipients. They are similarly uh, mm -hmm. uh, illegally denying them to others, which they only did as a matter of spite in order to try to win this lawsuit. They changed their policy in the middle of the lawsuit after for years granting uh, some, something close to 50,000 licenses to other people with other deferred action statuses. Um, it sounds like the governor's attorneys are acting as if they want to pursue an appeal to the Supreme Court. Uh, your thoughts? Again, uh, you would think that uh, at some point the executive uh, of our state would know what illegal and unconstitutional means and not continue to waste taxpayer money uh, on these type of lawsuits. But the uh, anti-immigrant animus, as was found by the Ninth Circuit here, as we know, pervades much uh, activity in this state, including, of course, SB 1070, uh, has prevailed over uh, concerns about legality. So they appear to be continuing uh, this path of trying to uh, uh, reverse uh, what has been a very well reasoned and clear opinion, and one that's consistent with 48 other states in the United States uh, that for these folks uh, deserve and are, should be getting driver's licenses. It's just Nebraska and Arizona, correct? Just Nebraska and Arizona are the outliers, and Nebraska is still under litigation. As far as uh, the high court, what it did today, any indication of why they acted, or was it just relatively quick and down and dirty and it's over with? Well, it's down and dirty in that they didn't give any reasons, but uh, obviously if they were considering taking this case on, and the court, of course, takes 
context, many fewer cases uh, than are sought for review by the Supreme Court. If they were considering taking it on, you would have expected they would have granted the stay. Uh, they will not be looking to reverse two years down the road from now uh, when people have been getting thousands of people driver's licenses uh, pursuant to the law uh, that they will reverse that. So it certainly is a strong indication uh, that uh, any further attempts will be futile, uh, but I wouldn't put it past uh, this particular administration to continue uh, the battle. Well, you bring that up, and that's one of the governor's, uh, the attorneys for the governor's, uh, their arguments is that it's premature to issue these licenses in case it gets to the Supreme Court, in case the whole thing is turned over. Well, of course, that's turning the argument on its head. Um, in, in fact, it has been found at every level that the, the denial of the licenses violates fundamental rights of equal protection, uh, that they are treating dreamers because of the animus uh, from the executive branch, uh, dreamers differently and much worse than others with the deferred action status. And both the uh, district court stated that, uh, the Ninth Circuit in a very strong unanimous opinion stated that. Uh, so uh, there's no reason to stay something which is clearly illegal uh, and, and unconstitutional. And, and you would think that that uh, would, would, in fact, uh, uh, impact uh, policy in this state. Unfortunately, too often it has not. Uh, the governor's office, the attorneys, also argued that an informal Fed policy, a policy from the federal branch, uh, from the executive branch, should not trump state law. Didn't seem to fly. Well, because it's wrong. This was not an informal uh, federal policy. It was an executive action. Uh, Congress has allowed such actions and indeed authorized such actions in the past. There are many similar actions. Uh, many of the deferred actions uh, categories uh, are based on executive action and, and driver's licenses have been granted in those cases even by Arizona. Uh, so this was an attempt to um, dredge up any argument, whether it had any merit or not, uh, by the, those defending uh, the state in this case. Uh, the courts saw through those uh, uh, flimsy excuses, uh, irrational excuses is what the court said, uh, without any legitimacy in terms of governmental objectives and, to, and, and denied uh, their ability to continue this course of action. And yet it was close. I mean, three of the Supreme Court justices would have kept the stay and would have, it sounds like, might have even accepted the case further down the line. Well, six to three is, is a pretty good margin of victory in this Supreme Court these days. But you need four, right? If, you if need four. four to take the case. And obviously, if there was a fourth person, one would have expected that that person would have also granted the stay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what's next in all this as far as the dreamers are concerned, as far as everyone is concerned? Well, the Ninth Circuit very quickly indeed today, the same day as the Supreme Court opinion, uh, uh, put out this mandate to the district court uh, to, uh, in fact, enter this order, the preliminary injunction uh, that bars the state from continuing this illegal uh, course of action and start granting licenses finally to folks who deserve them starting two years ago. So basically, get the tests done and uh, the driver's licenses right. are issued. So start to start, going. <laughs> start your engines. As All right. Uh, good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. The state health department is warning that the flu season could be especially bad this year. Jessica Riggler is the chief of the Epidemiology and Disease Control Bureau at the Arizona Department of Health Services. She joins us now. Good to see you again. Uh, this flu season could be worse. What's going on out there? So right now we've seen that the majority of the flu strains that are circulating here or infecting people are flu H3N2. And that particular strain of flu has been shown to be kind of nasty. In seasons where that's the primary strain circulating, we see more hospitalizations and more deaths from flu. And it's particularly nasty and more this hospitalization. Why? Does it affect certain areas more? Is it just a stronger strain? Yeah, it's just hard to say. Flu is very unpredictable and there's many different 
types of flu. So, you know, we had H1N1 during the pandemic. For some reason, H3N2 just seems to hit people harder, especially the very old, the very young, and those that are, immu are immunocompromised. And, and as far as where this strain, this particular strain comes from, do, you, do we know that? I mean, it sounds like it's been around for a while. It has. The H3N2 is a strain of influenza that's been around for a very long time. And it develops usually where, where do we first start seeing flu outbreaks? Uh, you mean in the country? In or? the world. It depends. So flu circulates year round. That's why our public health departments actually monitor flu all, all throughout the year. We think about it as a winter virus, but mm -hmm. it really can happen in the summer anytime. It's just that we have more cases in the winter. But in our summertime, that's when the southern hemisphere is having their big flu outbreaks and their peaks of so flu. So you can kind of kind of see what's happening down there and say, look out, here it comes. Exactly. Uh, are the symptoms for this particular strain any different? You know, flu is severe and serious in almost all cases. You feel like you've been hit by a bus. You've got the fever, the body aches, significant fatigue, respiratory symptoms like runny nose or cough. And that's pretty similar with all strains of flu. It's just that this one sometimes can get people harder or cause more severe illness that would require hospitalization. Now let's talk about flu shots. Those who have had flu shots, are they okay? Or because this has kind of had a little bit of a variant, is that a concern? It's, it's a little bit of a concern, but I'll say to start with that the best protection against the flu is to get the flu shot. Whether the flu shot is a perfect match for the circulating strains or an imperfect match as it is this year, some protection is better than no protection at all. But, so because the strain changed and is different than the original vaccine, uh, that you're saying that's, that original vaccine could still be good? Yeah, so one thing to note about flu shots is that they protect against either three or four strains of flu. Mm. So while that one particular strain has drifted a little bit, so the vaccine's not a perfect match, it still is a good match for the other two to three strains that were included. And then in addition, when you're vaccinated, sometimes your body can still produce antibodies that can cross-react with that strain. So even if the vaccine isn't a perfect match, the antibodies your body has developed can help protect you from that. So, so will another vaccine be developed or is this particular vaccine going to last throughout the season? This will be the vaccine we have for the season. It takes about six months for flu shots to be developed by manufacturers. And so they actually start in about January or February every year to produce the shots for the next flu season. Interesting. Uh, how often does a strain kind of run amok and go off on its own direction? Well, with many viruses, we expect um, routine kind of drifts in, in the strain, and, and that's normal. It, it just depends on the particular virus, how much or how fast it mutates. For the last couple of years, we've had pretty standard flu strains that haven't really mutated that much. And as far as the flu shot is concerned, how long before you build immunity? It typically takes about two weeks to get immunity. So we would suggest people get vaccinated early in the season. However, it's not too late. If you get vaccinated now, you'll still be protected early to mid-January. And we generally see our peaks in flu activity around February, so there's still time. I was going to ask that. Are we in the flu season now? Yeah, our flu season officially started at the very beginning of October. My We're goodness. seeing local activity. So 14 of our 15 counties have had cases. We've had about 400 cases reported statewide so far this year, which is on course with what we saw last year. So we, we are getting flu cases. It's just not that big peak that we typically see a little later in the winter. And when do we usually say adios to flu season? What... Uh... Well, typically we see cases start trailing off in April, May. Last year it was more May, June. But like I said, we still get cases year round. So June, July, August, you can still see sporadic cases popping up. It, 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 and is, is there any reason why a flu season would be unusually long? Would a strain like this that is more, it seems to be more strong than, than some of the others, would that be a factor in something like that? Or is it just all kind of chance? Flu is really unpredictable. So with the pandemic H1N1 strain, we saw flu season that started up in April and then kind of went down and then started back up again in September. Um, it's just very difficult to say uh, what st circulating can change in the middle of the season too. Right now we have a lot of H3N2. Later it might be more influenza B or H1N1. It's just hard to say. If, you, if you're really up on the flu and you know you had this H3, H3N2, is that what it is? Mm -hmm. And you know you had it back when it came a few years ago or something. Uh, does that provide any immunity at all? Can you get the same flu over and over again? Because the virus shifts or drifts just a little bit, it is possible to be reinfected with a different 
type of that virus, basically. So basically, you can't. It's, it's not the kind of thing, it's not like mumps or measles or something. You get it, right. you're over with it. Done. That's right. That's interesting. I think that, that kind of goes against common sense, doesn't it? Yeah, well, that's why it's important to get vaccinated every year because that vaccine hopefully will be protecting you against the strains that are circulating that particular I see. season. And especially, you're saying now, especially uh, younger folks and older folks. Yeah, we recommend everyone gets vaccinated, but you'll see the most severe illness in those that are very young or very old or have other immunocompromising conditions. Last question, most important thing for people to know as we uh, as we make our way into the, the deepest, darkest part of flu season. Yeah, flu vaccine is the best protection, but always remember washing your hands, covering your coughs and sneezes, staying home when you're sick and staying away from sick people will help keep you well. All right, very good. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. Former Phoenix Mayor John Driggs died earlier this month at the age of 87. Driggs served as mayor in the 1970s. He helped expand the city's boundaries and was instrumental in creating more open space preserves. Driggs also came from a banking family and was chairman of Western Savings and Loan when the SNL collapsed in the late 1980s. Here now to tell us more about John Driggs' his life and legacy is Terry Goddard, who served as mayor of Phoenix in the decade after. Driggs left office. Good to see you again. Thank you. Uh, nice to be back here. Can I call you Mr. Mayor? I mean, I haven't done that in a while. It's holy. Uh, I'm who, always, always honored by that name. Who was John Driggs? John Driggs was amazing. Uh, he was, and, and, and thinking about him, although I'm very sad at his passing, is, is a happy thing for me and I think for thousands of people in this city. Uh, he was not somebody handicapped by limited vision or by small ideas. And throughout his career, he championed the Phoenix Mountain Preserves, 30,000 acres of public land, the biggest park in America, for a city park. Uh, he, was, he was instrumental in, in uh, going and saving uh, and, 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 and transforming Heritage Square, especially the Rossen House, which is perhaps his most important uh, signature project. But after that, he tried to make the, uh, the Capitol Mall into something to be proud of instead of someplace to, uh, to go under duress. And um, he had other great dreams for Papago Park, a jewel of a city that had languished and fallen into disrepair. Uh, there was nothing that he looked at that he didn't think couldn't be improved and improved in a big way. It, it, I, I know he had those dreams later in life. I know because every time I saw him, he, he grabs your arm and he starts telling you exactly <laughs> what he wants you to do. But when he was in office, when he was running for office, I know this is a little before your time, but not much, uh, you were here. Was he that kind of guy in office? Well. He was in office at a time of constraint, and, and, and except for the, the mountain preserves, um, I, I, I don't point to too many things, although he was the chairman of the bond committee in 1969 that, that helped to greatly expand services in Phoenix, uh, and he was the handshake, uh, handshake artist of the whole Ahwatukee Foothills uh, expansion for the city of Phoenix. So these are pretty grand dreams, too, and, and so I don't think there was any, any time in John Driggs' life that he didn't think big. Was he a low profile or high profile mayor? He was a he was very much a, uh, a facilitator mayor. He was somebody who understood the private business side. He knew how to make things happen from a business perspective. And for a Phoenix mayor, that was a very valuable, uh, very valuable asset. Were there reasons why he didn't run for re-election? Did he run for re-election? Well, he ran for mayor, he ran for, and for governor. He, he, oh, he, he did uh, run for, okay. And, and he did, bear in mind, you gotta take the times into, into account. He ran against Milt Graham because Milt had the temerity to decide to run for a third term as mayor. Um, that was something charter government, the prevailing rulers in Phoenix, did not allow. John then served his two terms from 1970 to 1974, these were two-year terms as mayor in those days. 
and, uh, and then he ran for governor. Uh, unsuccessful in the primary, but he was a magnificent candidate. Uh, she, even then he had very, very strong uh, white hair. And my memory of, of John Driggs as a gubernatorial candidate was he was by far the best horseman in the Prescott Rodeo Parade. <laughs> I see. Um, he was also, and I remember this clear as a bell, the idea that we were going to get a super colliding, superconductor, big old thing out there that was going to smash atoms and put us on the map. We never got it, did Many we? of us sucked into that dream. Of, uh, and, and no, we didn't get it. Uh, we had a governor in those days named Evan Meekum, and, and people didn't want to invest in Arizona. Uh, but not for want of trying by John Drake's. Uh, he was he was out with the the passion, and it, later in life he carried a, what I guess was a hickory stick, a, a long cane. On top of it was a brass historic door handle, uh, doorknob, and. Uh, I never saw him use it in anger, but uh, you always thought, well, if he picked that up and swung at you, <laughs> he it would make a hell of a welt. Uh, and you mentioned Ahwatukee. This is so fascinating because I think when people move here, one of the, they, they're fascinated by Ahwatukee. It's this kind of thing out there. It's the largest cul-de-sac in the world. Everyone knows about the traffic problems out there. But they're surprised that it's part of Phoenix as opposed to Tempe or Chandler. Or something. How did that work? John Driggs created that. John, John Driggs on a handshake with the then Supervisor Stark, who also represented the Presley Development Company. Uh, made Ahwatukee come into Phoenix, it, you know, and you're right, it, it, it may not be the most logical extension of the city boundaries, but at that time there was a lot of uh, anxiety about growth, there was feelings that we had certain territorial imperatives, uh, South Mountain clearly was a big part of Phoenix and he wanted to have both sides of it. And uh, he agreed uh, on a handshake uh, to make the annexation. I had to pick up the the, the, the details of that annexation because by the time I was mayor, we had to provide streets and we had mm -hmm. to get sewer and water to fulfill the, the, the Driggs dream and it wasn't easy. Uh, but I have great admiration for the guy who had the dream. Indeed, he also had an, a lifelong, apparently, dream, Tovery Castle. He just loved that. What's, what's the deal with Tovery well, Castle? Tovery, the Arizona ziggurat, uh, the Karana family's uh, uh, amazing uh, testament. Uh, some people say it's a work of absolute lunacy, uh, <laughs> but it stands out, and people in Phoenix know it as the Tovery Castle. And John thought it would be the most magnificent place for a hospitality center for the state of Arizona, not just Phoenix that if somebody came to visit, they should be received at the Tovery Castle. And he went to work to, to realize that dream. When I was mayor, we put some bond money aside to purchase the Tovery Castle from the Tovery family. Um, and and uh, it turned out not to be adequate for the job. And so John's dream was to finish the job, to make sure that all of that parcel of land and the castle got included, got restored. And what you see today is very nearly achieved. Uh, he, he got it done. He got it done by a certain amount of wit and persistence and a little development scheme that I was part of that frankly shamed the city council into leaving the job half done. Interesting. So I've got the papers right here. And, 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 and the, the papers, what are this those? This is things? the Tovery Castle Community Investment LLC, <laughs> formed see. by John Driggs and Terry Goddard. Uh, shares and he available? Was out, absolutely. Shares were available for $100,000 a share. He sold one. And he had prospects for quite a few others from some of his good friends in the business community. And because of that, because there was this possibility that this old, this former mayor, excuse me, let's not say old, uh, was going to shame the council into doing what they wouldn't do, uh, Phil Gordon and the city council did the right thing and, and put additional resources into fixing up Covery Castle. And it should be open to the public uh, very soon if it isn't already. I mean, that's a, it's a magnificent. Yes, it is. It's, it's a, it's it's a strange of, place, it's yes. an unusual place, but Phoenix loves it, and I think it's an important part of our heritage, and John sure thought so. Uh, real quickly, we don't have too much time here, but the SNL scan, I know the SNL scandal and the crisis and, and the, uh, the family-owned bank, that, was, that, that had to have hurt him a lot. Talk to us quickly about what happened. Well, there. Western Savings was, was a great dream also, and, and his brother Gary uh, uh, thought big as well, and they got in perhaps into an over, over, over invested in things that perhaps were not wise in retrospect, but who could have said during the go-go period that they were doing that, that this was going to crash. Um, I, I, I can't either defend or criticize what happened. I, I know that it was hard on the whole family, 
Uh, but the Driggses are survivors, and, and they have come back. Gary Driggs is still the best Santa Claus in America, as far as I'm concerned. And John was somebody who never missed a step, as far as I can tell. He had some financial reverses, but he came back, and his 30 years after he was mayor of service to the city of Phoenix is absolutely unmatched because he was always there when a mayor or a councilman or somebody else said, we've got a public job that needs to be done. John Driggs was there to do it. And that's his legacy, that can-do spirit. Oh, it's amazing. And, and, uh, and he's left a mark on our city. The Rossen House is perhaps the most tangible yes. uh, part of it. But All uh, of the improvements Park. of Heritage yeah. Park, the Tovery Castle, and a commitment to preservation which endures. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, and thanks for talking about John Driggs. Thank you. We appreciate a it. Great Arizona. Thursday on Arizona Horizon, could releases of Colorado River water in Arizona be cut in coming years due to drought? And more students are getting an arts education, but a new report says there's room for improvement. That's Thursday evening, 5, 30, and 10, right here on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.